The flag's now raised. They're off. Away first time for the Weatherby's champion bumper at Tishan in the blue and pink racing enthusiastically leading the field up the straight first time with Quebecois tablemates in behind orange jacket slip streaming Tishan. Six mile bridge in the pink silks is handy with Bill Joyce in a white jacket and set a chance with the white face away to the right. Sands victorious dark jacket with the white sleeves just in behind the leaders with the yellow clay and the red cap and just in behind stable mate Jean Dudery who's in the maroon and white jiggins turn silks. Away to the left, Brani Frost on the grey, Stabby is upside Cantico in the brown and yellow. Union Avenue in a red jacket back in midfield, just behind you ought to know in the purple and yellow and the grey Argento boy and Fleuro Fuse all the hoops on the cap. Further back then to Romeo Coolio in a black and white jacket, Dirty Den in the maroon and white is towards the rear early with Fishery Lane. Jasmine de Moe ridden with great patience by Patrick Mullins and the double green is in the last group of four and alongside him Harry Skelton, black jacket aboard Royal Infantry as they climb the hill and head towards the end of more than half a mile in the Weatherby's champion bumper. And it's Tishan who leads up to the yellow clay in Quebecois. And then Cantico and the Grey Stabby races out wide, followed by Jalon Dudery. Six mile bridge in a pink jacket towards the inside from Sands Victorious, and then Bill Joyce in the white silks. Uh, towards the inside, Set a Chance was cutting the corner. Still held up at this stage, Jasmine DeVoe with just Royal Infantry and Fishery Lane in behind. But in truth, they're uh, very well grouped as they move steadily towards the end of more than three quarters of a mile. And Tishan takes them along at around about 30 miles an hour with little more than 10 lengths covering the field. Quebecois, orange jacket, is disputing second with the yellow clay. And then Cantico with the yellow cap to the grey stabby wide. Jalon Dudery and the maroon and white handy with set a chance towards the near side of Six Mile Bridge and Sands Victorious. The other of the greys, Argento boy in a red cap, has now out wide. Jasmine DeVoe begins to creep a little bit closer. The double green silks, the spotted cap for Patrick Mullins. He's followed out deep by Royal Infantry. You ought to know in the purple and yellow is held up with Romeo Coolio in Union Avenue in Fishery Lane and Dirty Den is last of us still. Very well clustered up field with Fleur O Fusil pulling hard in midfield. The shades of blue, the hoop cap for Jody Townend. Across the top of the track they go, well beyond the halfway point in the Weatherby's champion bumper. Tishan, who was keen in the early part of the race, still leading by two lengths. The one who's dropped off from is Stavi beginning to tail off. The yellow clay sits on the leader's tail just ahead of Quebecois orange jacket in third. Cantico begins the descent close up with owner mate the grey Argento boy out wide stab is being pulled up. Set a chance is down on the inner tracking Jalon Dudery on the descent. Then Sands victorious dark jacket with the white sleeves only three lengths off the lead. In truth most of them have a chance here as they head inside the last half mile and they're about to begin the run for home. Tishan. The yellow clay with the red cap, Quebecois, out wide, Cantico and Argento boy, followed there by Jasmine Deveau in the double green and Royal Infantry in a black jacket, then Fleur O'Fusil and Sands victorious, Jalon Dudery in the maroon and white is poised, Romeo Coolio, black and white, getting into it on the inner as Quebecois falls back through the field and they're about to swing for home just outside the last quarter mile, Tishan, the strong challenging Jalon Dudery comes there powerfully with stablemate Romeo Coolio out wide the yellow clay into the straight they come widest of all Jasmine DeVoe away to the left from Fleur O'Fusil it's an Elliot Pair who've moved on here Romeo Coolio noses ahead under Keith Donahue away to the left Jasmine DeVoe though has been into search home the other Elliot Brother battling away Jalon Dudery deep inside the furlong Jasmine DeVoe is this Willie Mullins state with destiny he has to fight hard because Romeo Coolio is battling back willingly by the hands of Patrick Mullins it's Jasmine DeVoe, Willie Mullins, 100 not out of the Cheltenham Festival. Romeo Cuneo went down fighting, very close to third between Jalon Dudery and Sands Victorious and running on late Fishery Lane. A century of winners here at the Cheltenham Festival for Willie Mullins. Will we ever see his like again, unless it's another century from the same person, perhaps? Many, many congratulations. Thank you. How are you feeling right now? You've just been posing for pictures uh, with your team. It's hard to know how to feel because it's not something anyone ever dreamt of, that anyone would ever have 100 winners in Cheltenham. I know my first one in 1985 was Tourist Attraction. I went home thinking that was going to be my lifetime's achievement, to have a winner in Cheltenham from an Irish yard. At that time, they were very scarce. Um, you know, but 
we just got a tremendous group of owners behind us and you know that's you need owners to have a base of the yard then uh, you know Jackie my wife Patrick uh, David Casey Ruby all the team the backroom team that we have Ben uh, my belt Dunmer my traveling head man and it's just uh, it just starts with owners I think you know if you've got good owners support you and they've been tremendous to us down through the years and it's the sourcing of the horses as well I, I imagine Harold Kirk and Pierre Boulard yes um, been tremendous buying buying horses from all areas like France, flat racing, point to points, English point to points, stores. You know, the racehorses come from all areas, and you, and you never know what the champion of the day are buying. You, we buy lots of horses, we think they're champions, they're disappointing. And then the ones, uh, maybe the cheaper ones, turn out to be champions. It's, that's what keeps this game going around all the time. And this is such an incredible place to manage that, an achievement like that. Can you remember the first time that you came to Cheltenham and what you made of it? Oh, I think it was the year that the snow. Um, the snow abandoned the gold cup was it uh, god knows i don't know what year it was but um uh, yeah i mean to an irish person cheltenham is the mecca of jump racing and i think racing in general uh, in general like the england and ireland people jump racing to have a place like here which is you know place people want to come it's their cup final it's their whatever I get asked to buy a horse and I ask them, you know, what type of a horse do you want? Willie, could you get me something that might run in Cheltenham? Not even win in Cheltenham, but just to run here and be part of the atmosphere. And that's why we have to be delighted that Cheltenham is what it is. A lot of people say it maybe overshadows the whole thing, but I think without Cheltenham, we wouldn't have a vibrant racing, jump racing industry that we have. Here, here. Um, I asked Patrick what might have been the key moments in your career, and he cited when Jigginstown decided to take their horses away and your reaction to that, the way in which you actually decided that you were going to come back bigger, stronger, better. Do you agree with him with that? In a way, yes, but it was about survival. <laughs> we did come back bigger and stronger, but it was about, you know, we knew, um, what did we lose, about a, a third of our business at the time, and, but I knew we still had a good basis, and this is coming back to owners. I had lots of lovely owners, single, up fellows with one horse, maybe two horses. And, you know, I knew I had people that were there uh, to back us, and they did, and we grew again. Um, but every business has something like that. You know, you, you have bad days in your business. You black swans come in and, sorry, and, and cut you out. And, um, you know, I, I look at Nikki this week. I mean, you know, that's the thing we dread, that something like that happens uh, the week before Cheltenham, that the horses lose form for now no apparent reason. Uh, you know, so we feel for Nikki. We know what it's like that, uh, you know, it, it's the one dread everyone has. And, um, you know, so we're lucky our horse were firing this week. We took advantage of that. But, um, you know, we it's a small sport in a way, so we... We enjoy our colleagues' wins, but we're also disappointed when they have hard luck. And as a lot of trainers supported me when we go, you know, go through a rough time. Uh, you know, it, 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 the jockey's room, the, the, the way room, the trainer's room, it, it's small even between Ireland and England. Everyone knows everyone else and everyone feels everyone's pain if they have a bad day. These are wonderful words. I think you've seen that the whole crowd were so delighted for you with this marvellous achievement and Thank you're you. not done yet. Many congratulations and best of luck for the rest of the festival as well. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers. You. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> a very special moment here in the Winston Enclosure. Willie Mullins has worked a century of races at the Cheltenham Festival and of course his son Patrick was on board, Jasmine DeVoe in the Weatherby's champion bumper. I know from a team perspective you'd have liked it to have come earlier, but this is, must be a very special moment for you. Ah, it is. I mean, look, it's a number you, you don't even dream of. So um, it's something that wasn't possible before, and that the enlarged program has made it possible. But uh, I'm very privileged to be to get the hundred for for my father. That's a special moment. Yeah. I think it's not just the enlarged program, is it? <laughs> it it's because the, the number of winners, in, particularly in recent seasons, and the dominance of the stable. You're really well positioned to tell us what makes your dad so special. Um, well, I, I always bring it back to when the gigging gig sound split happened and we lost the, the biggest owner in racing and, and a third or a quarter of our horses. And instead of, you know, in his early 60s, instead of him consolidating and maybe finishing second or third, he went out and he got more owners, more horses, more staff, more problems and, and got bigger because of it. And I think if that hadn't happened, we mightn't be where we are right now either.
And it's the calibre of, of the team as well, the calibre of that staff that he's attracted to the yard. Oh, well, I mean, the, the calibre of staff you have, Ben Delmar, Rachel Robbins, Virginie Basco, Dick Dowling, David Casey, Ruby Walsh, um, and then the owners he's built, you know, the, starting with Rich, that was our kickstart. And now, you know, for the many years, the Donnellys, Shealy Park and others, um, he's made the very most of everything he's, he's been able to. And the sourcing of the horses as well with Harold Kirk? Harold has been amazing. Pierre Boulard as well. Um, they work as a fantastic team and uh, oh, it, every, everything counts, yeah. And give us an insight to what it's like working with your dad as well, because it's always different when you're working with a, with a member of your family. Give a sort of insight to a typical day at Clisson. Several headaches. Um, he's, uh, look, he could say something one day and when you do that the next day he'll give out to you for doing it and he forgets that he told you to do it the day before. <laughs> he's always chopping and changing things. He's never standing still. He can't be told no. I remember when David Casey got his appendix out, he couldn't go down, fly down to Melbourne. So Willie said, what well, can we get him there by land? To, Mel <laughs> to Melbourne. Like, who else would even, I like, uh, and it's that kind of thinking, you know. Um, it's outside the box. It's a bit, at times it can be like the man from the moon, but um, enough of it works. And what have you learned from watching your father? Uh, never be afraid to try things. Uh, don't be afraid of messing up. And um, like I said, never fall out with anyone. The gig is down, they're back now. And, you know, when things happen, they happen. Um, but... Uh, and have belief in yourself. Like I mean, he's a funny man in that the more you try to tell him to do something, the more inclined he is to do the opposite. So <laughs> you have to work around that as well, reverse psychology sometimes. <laughs> I can see that. Now, you picked right, didn't you? You had a choice of nine and you picked Jasmine Devo? Uh, for once, for once. <laughs> well, I couldn't ride the fillies at the weight, so that was seven. Um, look, he was the horse that had nothing going against him. Everything else had a, a minor mark against him. The only thing you can hold against him is how he looks. He's very small, he's very narrow, he's very short. He doesn't do anything flashy. Um, but when I had a look under the bonnet in Nace, there was plenty there. And how did that race pan out? Describe it to me, please. Uh, I wanted to be wide and uh, out of the ruck because he's not a big horse. He don't want to be getting bashed around. I was probably further back than I wanted, but we went a real good gallop for the first six furlongs. And then I was able to slide forward down the back straight, get in. And um, every time I needed to make ground, he was able to do it. So even though we were wide, I was able to go where I wanted. I wasn't, have, I wasn't at the mercy of anyone else. They're called bumpers for a reason. Well, many congratulations. I suspect it'll only be a sort of mini celebration tonight because we've got two more days of business to get on with. Yeah, Friday night should be good. <laughs> well, many congratulations. What a brilliant day. Well done. Thanks, Lydia. Thanks very much. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.